So Aaron, please take it away and tell us about the lamprey. Yeah, everybody hear me okay? Yes, we hear you and see your slides. Okay, great, thanks. My name is Aaron Jackson. I currently serve as the uh, project leader for the, for the Pacific Lamprey Research and Restoration Project. This project has been around for a little while. It started in 1994. It's funded by Bonneville Power Administration and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. I'll make my next slide go here. So I'd be a little remiss if I didn't introduce the lamprey team. All these guys are very dedicated to our first foods, to um, our natural resources. They, they love lamprey. They enjoy working with lamprey. These guys are all experts in their fields. Um, really appreciate the efforts that they put forward for, uh, for our first foods. The study area for this project has primarily been focused in the Umatilla Basin, but um, we also have, you know, uh, projects going on in other seeded lands within the Toucan and the Walla Walla, Grand Ron, uh, John Day and Imnaha. And I, I also mentioned the, the burnt Malheur and powder systems and the Willow Creek system as well, but uh, we have yet to move into those basins. Um, but primarily the focus so far has been in the Umatilla River, and we have started some translocation in the Grand Ronde Subbasin. But today I'll, I'll probably really focus on the Umatilla River. So first, some Pacific lamprey evolution. Um, you know, lampreys are, are really old. They've been around a long, long time. They are <clears throat> the oldest uh, uh, species about out there right now, back about 450 million years. Some literature even states that they're back to 530 million years ago. To put that into context, dinosaurs came and went from about 240 to 60 million years ago. The current modern salmon evolved about 6 million years ago and us as humans about 100,000 years ago. <clears throat> There's 43 species worldwide of, of lampreys. Um, five are now extinct. Three species are in the Columbia River Basin. We have the Western Brook, which is a modern anadromous lamprey. That means it does not go to the ocean and back. It stays in the river systems its entire life history. We have a river lamprey that is found down in the more the middle of the Columbia River and the lower Columbia River. It is an anadromous species. And then we have Pacific lamprey. Um, all three of these species exist within our seeded areas. I'll talk about the life cycle starting at six o'clock on the figure. Um, after lamprey um, hatch, they spend, you know, four to six years in this larval phase feeding on detritus so they live down in the uh, sand matter of fact the word amacete is a latin word for the, for those that live among sand and so um, it makes sense that this life stage they're called amacetes we are though have seen some new data that states that uh, lamprey can spend up to 13 years in the sedentary stage which is quite amazing before moving out um, in, into um, the uh, emerging from the stream and headed to the ocean and so after that uh, time phase in the uh, stream sediment, they go through a metamorphosis where they develop eyes and a mouth to prepare for uh, moving out into the ocean environment. And that usually happens in the fall, late fall to the early spring on high, high flow events. They move out into the ocean where they enter this parasitic phase and lamprey feed on a variety of species, primarily ground fish, um, but they're known to be on salmon and um, even whales to feed as well. Um, then they come back into the freshwater systems in a spring where they typically overwinter and spawn the following spring and their carcasses, as carcasses they die and uh, they provide those marine derived nutrients that other organisms tend to live off of. Um, CTR's lamprey project goals really is to restore natural production of Pacific lamprey in the Umatilla, Grand Ron, Toucanon and Walla Walla rivers to self-sustaining and harvestable levels, and also to evaluate the success of that restoration to inform management and for potential application elsewhere. Our project goals within the Umatilla Basin are to monitor success of adult migration, spawning, and also juvenile rearing and out migration, but also to continue to identify those limiting factors and to seek remedies for those limiting factors. Within the seeded area subbasins, uh, we're just moving out into those areas. We're starting to conduct juvenile abundance surveys, monitor adult passage trends at the Columbia River and Snake River dams. And we did initiate adult translocation in the Grand Ronde Basin in 2015. Other objectives within the Lamprey Project are Lamprey Passage. We're looking at and have installed four Lamprey Passage structures in the Umatilla Basin. 
We're monitoring adult passage success over these low elevation diversions Gary and talked about earlier. We're developing and applying pit tagging technology in the Umatilla and Columbia River Basin for the juvenile phase. And we're conducting new research in juvenile tagging, genetics, and eDNA. Additionally, we have um, spent a number of years working in artificial propagation um, to initiate lamprey holding, spawning, incubation, and rearing experiments in the lab environment. That's over at the Walla Walla Community College, uh, what we call the WEC Lab, the Water Environmental Center. And with the ultimate goal there is to successfully propagate two juvenile products, a real early life stage pro larvae and an amicete for eventual release in the toucan and in Walla Walla. And we're really hoping to get the, the first pro larvae out in the toucan and river in just a few months. The Umatilla River, though, is really our first pilot program. It was a before and after translocation study in the Umatilla River. And translocation, all that really means is collecting fish from one location, location and moving them to another location. And so our case study sampling began in 98, followed by adult translocation in 2000. And the key question we asked was, can these translocated fish increase natural production and restore self-sustaining and harvestable levels of lamprey? So to do that, we have to go down and collect brood from the main stem dams. Um, adults are collected from Bonneville, the Dalles, and John Day dams from May through September. Um, adults are held at the South Fork Walla Walla facility and then in the fall we move them to Minthorn Springs until they mature. And that first translocation occurred in the Umatilla River in 2000. And on the left you can see the traps that we developed. You know, uh, the one thing the Corps of Engineers will not let us fish these traps inside areas where salmon are. And so uh, lamprey like to squeeze just about anywhere they can at, a, at, a, at one of the dams. And a lot of the gratings have one inch wide gaps and lamprey can tend to get behind those areas. And so we were designed these special funnel traps, we call them, to actually um, pull the lamprey out of there. We're rescuing them because it, they're dead ends for lamprey anyways, and it's also providing the fish for our, for our brood. So we have some findings from that work, from the translocation work. Um, one thing is that adults are relatively easy to hold until sexual maturity. We see a very low holding mortality, less than 1% a year. And um, I know that other species struggle with that because of high temperatures. Lampreys seem to do fairly well in a, in a warming climate. Um, we release up to about 280 adults annually. That's varied from years where we've only had as few as 68 fish to as many as 600. But recently that's been less and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the outplanting occurs in April through June. Um, and then adults are primarily released in the Umatilla River and Meacham Creek and Esculpa Creek. We have moved some into Wild Horse recently um, and just starting to spread those fish out a little bit within the, within the basin. Uh, some additional findings of the red surveys. We found that uh, translocated lamprey successfully built nests. We're seeing reds um, all the way through the areas that are close to our release locations. Spawning occurs in May through July, and we found that the adults spawn real close to the release locations, which I said. Um, there's other hot spots, you know, for lamprey spawning tend to be Bear Creek, which is in the upper uh, Umatilla River, Camp Creek, which is about, uh, oh, 15 miles or so up the Meacham Creek, and then also down around Thorn Hollow. And Thorn Hollow is really interesting because uh, before we did translocation, and when there used to be lamprey here in the, you know, 1940s, 50s, um, tribal elders talked about going to Thorn Hollow to harvest lamprey, and so um, it makes sense that um, there's some habitat there for them to spawn. But, um, you know, with a potential uh, climate change impact would be, you know, if we do see some increasing surface temps, you know, water temperature wise, we're potentially going to see reduced spawning habitat, which means less production in the lamprey, and also uh, a potential for re of that reduced first food availability. Regarding larval surveys, um, we go out as part of the monitoring here in the basin as we we, we um, look for the larval lamprey. <clears throat> um, egg viability was relatively high initially. Um, we can see that lamprey just dis distributed themselves from the headwaters and moved downstream through time. And we've seen an increase in, in time of the individuals per square meter. Um, we've also noticed, noticed that um, lamprey seem to 
uh, handle these higher water temperatures. You know, we've surveyed in, in areas where water temperatures are approaching 80 degrees or right at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're seeing lamprey thriving in those conditions. And so uh, may all may not be lost for a, a warming climate in the world of lamprey. It may actually uh, contribute to faster growth for them. However, if we do get those higher winter flows, as Jeremiah was talking about earlier, we would see this displacement of larvae and the larvae would be moving instead of continue rearing in the uh, tributary environment, be pushed out in the main stem environment where they have a chance to be uh, preyed upon more. And, and this can be a real issue because lamprey have such a long freshwater life history. I was mentioning earlier that, you know, their lamprey can spend up to potentially 13 years as an amicete before even moving out into the ocean environment. And so that could have a real large impact. Um, the diagram on the left, you can see, uh, was our work prior to translocation. We went out and surveyed. That's Andrew Wildbill and Donna Nez. Donna, you're going to hear from next here. Back in the day, she was one of our, our lamprey techs. And you can see that um, we didn't have many lamprey. Uh, the mission area starts around site 17 on this, on this diagram on the left. Years later, after doing translocation, boom, we have lamprey everywhere. And as you can see, most of the lamprey are on our reservation. So it's important that we continue to protect those. Five minute warning. Also, um, with the out migration, we're seeing, you know, these trends of uh, lamprey that are moving up in the uh, uh, and, and moving out um, within the Umatilla River. Trapping occurs from November to May to November or November to May, excuse me. And we're seeing an increase from time of, you know, 3,500 individuals up to over 850,000, but not in all years. Out, out migration timing correlates directly to large, large hydrologic events. And you can see um, the inset diagram kind of shows um, discharge in the dashed gray line and the black solid line is when lamprey are moving out. And so with that though, with we have a change in climate, increased temps may favor invasive species and also increased predation on on lamprey. In regards of adult immigrants, now these are adult lamprey that are coming back into the Umatilla River on their own. Adult numbers have shown this increased trend. You can see on the inset diagram with the red bars, that's the number of lamprey we've been getting back each year. We have a high R squared value that shows that the trend is increasing. But uh, most of the lamprey use the lamprey passage structures that we build at Three Mile Dam. But to put this into context, just in 2010 alone, we only had six lamprey coming back into the Umatilla River. In 2018, we had 4,703, which is huge. And because of that, the, the Umatilla River is starting to become a more natural self-sustaining population. So we haven't had to rely as much on translocation these last few years. But if we see increased temps, that could lead to poor migration and poor spawning. You know, we'll have less water, less opportunity for these lamprey to move up upstream and spawn and do their thing. This is a, a graph on adult timing. Uh, the solid line is um, discharge in the Umatilla River. I took the years 2010 through 2018 and averaged them, and, sh and this is what it came out showing. But we have two groups of lamprey that move into the Umatilla River. We have these spawning phase guys, and these are guys that are going to spawn that very year when they enter the Umatilla River. They come in in April and May. And then we also have a migratory phase, which are fish that have entered the Columbia River on a spring and have moved all the way into the tributary environment to overwinter in the tributary environment. If we see a shift in lamprey entrance timing or earlier low flows, that could be detrimental to lamprey up migration. So something to definitely consider. We had adult passage issues. Gary talked about diversion dams. Um, they're also problematic for, for lamprey, not just these big main stem dams, but even these small diversion dams are problematic. We use telemetry to determine locations and, and severity of passage issues and also to prioritize where we were going to do our work. We radio tagged a number of fish from 05 through 08 and passage success was really dir uh, directly correlated to flow, temperature, dam design and fish size. So if you didn't have a lot of flow, lamprey didn't pass. If you had high temperatures, lamprey held and they wouldn't pass. If you had a dam design, like a dam with an overhanging lip, lamprey had a hard time passing. And if you had a small fish, they also had a hard time passing those areas. But we've done some improvements. Um, we've installed these lamprey passage structures at Three Mile, Feed, and Maxwell, and Dillon diversions. The one in the picture here is at Three Mile Dam. We did some BPA flow enhancements in the lower four miles of the Umatilla River. 
during their migration period, July 1st, August 15th. And with those two things, the LPSs and the flow enhancement, we've seen an increase from 17% to 60% for passage at Three Mile Dam. A couple other benefits is that Dillon diversion and Brownell diversions have now both been removed in the Umatilla River. Hopefully some more will be coming soon. There's also juvenile passage needs. Um, we really need to understand juvenile passage and tributaries in the main stem environment. Um, salmonid screening systems do not adequately protect lamprey. You can see that clearly on the right hand side. Those are lamprey impinged on a salmonid screen. Um, investigate tributary and main stem juvenile lamprey passage and we need to seek solutions for safe passage. We're putting a lot of money into these fish here in the Umatilla River and it's not acceptable for them just to migrate downstream and get stuck at one of these irrigation diversions and die. Um, the challenge, however, with that is that lamprey are not ESA listed. Therefore, lamprey passage improvements have to be compatible with currently listed species. And time and time and time again, we come across with these great ideas, but they don't work with already listed species. So it's, it's problematic. We're conducting new research in juvenile tagging. We developed a new juvenile tag with high tag ret retention and high survivorship over the three month study. We implemented that uh, technology and we've tagged over 3000 juvenile lamprey. And during those study years, we saw that 11% of the juvenile lamprey were entrained into feed canal. And the migration rates range from uh, not moving very much, a uh, tenth of a mile to 22.2 kilometers in a day. Three mile dam to John Day dam travel times range from 13 to 131 days. But keep in mind that migration times in, in all species, this is not just lamprey, but all species widely vary depending on physiological constraints, environmental factors, and behavior of those fish. Uh, other new research that we're doing is artificial propagation. We've had some great success with spawning, fertilization, incubation, hatching, and rearing over at the WEC lab. And what we've learned is that larval lamprey are tolerant to low flow, high temperatures, and high dissolved oxygen. This may be a benefit in a, climbing, in a changing climate for lamprey. <clears throat> we've also ran into some challenges of how to move these fish from the facilities out to the field. We're working on refining that. <clears throat> also modifying the culture environment to better suit lamprey. Uh, we're learning that lamprey may, you know, re rely heavily on probiotics and maintaining and assessing large numbers of larvae. These guys hatch out at nine millimeters. They're itty bitty when they hatch. They're very difficult to count and to assess how just how many fish you have. But just for context, one female can have up to 200,000 eggs. And so um, with that high egg viability that I showed earlier, you know, it's, it's not unlikely that uh, with 200,000 eggs that um, 190,000 of them hatch successfully. One minute. However, one minute. with all that, the number one limiting factor still is passage. We see a 50% loss of adults at each dam and at each reservoir. So if you start with 100,000 lamprey at Bonneville, quickly you can count those all of those lamprey on your two hands at Lower Granite Dam, which is just, just unbelievable to, that we're still in those kind of conditions. And the juvenile losses may even be more significant. And we have studies geared up to, uh, to answer these questions starting in 2022 with some funding from the Corps of Engineers and partnerships between the Nez Perce, the Yakima, and the Umatilla tribes. But we need more funding to address these concerns. We have identified over $107 million worth of lamprey work that needs to occur as of right now. What's next? We're going to be implementing our lamprey master supplementation plan, and that's getting the fish out into the uh, to cannon and continue to do our adult translocation. We're going to continue to address main stem and tributary passage issues. It's the number one factor and advocate for the additional funding that we need. Continue to identify and seek solutions to address limiting factors in other basins. Um, we're just now starting to touch that as we're moving out into the other seeded areas. We're going to use genetics and eDNA for management applications, which is a, a new evolving technology. Continue to uh, have lamprey outreach and education programs and really the ultimate goal is to establish harvest opportunities in the Umatilla River and eventually other basins. We had our first ceremonial harvest of lamprey in 2018 and then we had our first uh, regular harvest of lamprey in 2019 in the Umatilla River. Um, also the, um, we I'm proud to say that we have provided the fish for the new display at the Oregon Zoo in the Great Northwest exhibit. If you haven't had a chance, they really dedicated a huge area to lamprey 
down there. So if you get a chance with your family, go check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. That was incredible information.